Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Timothy Lenton. He's Professor of Climate Change and Earth System Science at the University of Exeter and Director of the Global Systems Institute. He has over 20 years of research experience in studying the Earth as a system and developing and using models to understand its behavior. He is particularly interested in how life has reshaped the planet in the past and what lessons we can draw from this as we proceed to reshape the planet now. These topics are covered in his books Earth System Science and Revolutions That Made the Earth, which will be the focus of our conversation today. So, Dr. Lenton, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for having me, Ricardo. Okay, great. So, I mean, the first question I would like to ask you is, it seems by reading your book and also talking with people that I've had on the channel, that there is an intimate relationship between geology and life, or what perhaps people would call in geology the geosphere and the biosphere, right? That's right. We've perhaps all been brought up in an old-fashioned view of the world in which we, life is portrayed as like an actor on a stage that's set by geology and physics and chemistry. But the new scientific revolution that's happening in my field has shown for the last, in the last half century that it's not like that at all, that, that there's a, there are these intimate two-way connections between life and the non-living world. And life has profoundly reshaped the world, this planet that it inhabits. It's changed the composition of the atmosphere, it's changed the climate, it's, inf it's influenced the water cycle massively, and it may even have significantly influenced the geological things, including um, plate tectonics, although that's a more um, radical hypothesis. But it's, it's totally clear that life has created its own conditions for flourishing on, on Earth, and we're in, enjoying that in a sense, breathing an oxygen rich atmosphere that's created by many past generations of plants, algae and what we call cyanobacteria. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, uh, is there a set of conditions that we have to have set in place or we had back then to have set in place for life to arise on Earth? There's a general feeling that, yeah, there must be some necessary conditions for life to start on a planet. And there's a, there's a reasonable general assumption that liquid water is, is one of those essential conditions. And there's still a very lively debate about how life did start on the Earth. But without resolving that question, what has become obvious is that life started very early on Earth. I mean, the planet was formed a bit over four and a half billion years ago, and all the latest estimates would put the origin of life at least four billion years ago. So if that tells us anything, it might tell us that it's n not that difficult to evolve life at some level, or either that or we really are in a very um, rare situation in the cosmos. Um, but yeah, we... We, we can be clear that the Earth had that liquid water it needed for life very early on. And in fact, amazing evidence has come to light that the oceans were formed re really early. And um, beyond that, yes, life needs an energy source, but it clearly had that f from the sun in fact, once it, it evolved some form of photosynthesis. And before photosynthesis, most theories are looking at deep, see hydrothermal vents as a good sort of source of we call it chemical free energy for early life to get going before it then transitions to photosynthesizing photosynthesizing life in the surfaces of the ocean it's, and so forth mm -hmm. so, so hydrothermal we, vents probably were some of the places where life arose conceivably yes it's a the one it's a good source of chemical free energy and it's also a good source of materials which is the one other thing i didn't stress which is life needs all the materials it's going to build its 
body out of whatever that first cell looked like. And in the case of hydrothermal vents, you're you're at a place where not only have you got uh, an energy supply, you've got lots of material supply um, coming at that interface between the molten earth and the watery surface earth. So that's not a bad, for me, it's not a bad candidate for the origin of life. It's not the only possible environment, but some clues from molecular biology, etc., suggest that life has a very hot, so-called hyperthermophile origin, which would fit with the hydrothermal vent thesis. So I'm open to that, but I'm actually more interested in what happens once life does get started. When does it when does it transition to photosynthesizing life using the much greater source of energy from the sun? Um, and and how does it learn to recycle all the materials it needs? Because even though there is stuff coming out of the hydrothermal vents, it's like a really meager supply of materials compared to the amount that's continuously cycling through the biosphere today and through most of its history. So the recycling within the system is many, many thousands or millions of times greater than the inputs from from the crust or from the mantle. Um, so yeah, that for me is the beginning of what I'd call Gaia, when the early biosphere learns becomes a global force, accesses energy from the sun and, and solves the problem of recycling all the materials it needs. Mm -hmm. So in the book you talk about the critical steps model of life. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so that that idea is a sort of it's almost it's a part philosophical and part statistical idea that uh, that really relates to thinking about uh, humans ourselves as what, as a rare thing, as a self-aware creature that has the capacity to look back at the whole history of the planet in it inhabits, um, and then ask these kind of questions about. Um, how rare is our existence in the universe? How easy or difficult is it for life to get to the point we are at? And what the model does is it it uses some basic information like how far through the plausible span of life on this planet are we at the point where we're here and we've evolved and we're able to look back and marvel on what went before us. And then in a kind of clever statistical trick, it's able to use that, if you think about it as the fraction of the way through the, life, the eventual lifespan on life on the planet, how far through that are we? we one can use that to reverse deduce um, the idea that there might be some really difficult and rare events on the way to making you and I, but it can make an estimate of the number of those, and that, that's what are called the critical steps. It can infer something about the number of those critical steps from how late on we find ourselves or how early on we find ourselves in the, in, in the sort of eventual story of life on the planet. And the original estimates that were done on this by a guy called Brandon Carter, who came up with this idea, he thought that we'd evolved about halfway through the eventual span of life on Earth. And that would lead to the view that there might be a best guess, maybe maybe just one critical step, one difficult, really difficult thing in evolution between sort of no life and us. And then you could debate whether that was the origin of life itself or something later. Um, we updated that estimate, specifically my colleague Andy Watson updated that estimate and that model because we, we've known for a while now that we're probably, the Earth's biosphere that we're a part of is probably in old age. In other words, the sun is getting brighter over time. The future lifespan of life on Earth is almost certainly quite a lot shorter than the past of life on Earth, which I said was probably about 4 billion years. We might have another billion years to go. Um, we might be lucky and stretch it to a billion and a half, but then it looks like the planet would get overheated. And that that would maybe say we're four-fifths of the way through the eventual lifespan of life on Earth. And from that, we would 
infer back interestingly that there are more there are probably more difficult steps on the way to us um than brandon carter thought and we come up with maybe three is a rough three or four would be a good estimate and then the question of course becomes what are those really really difficult rare events in the history of of life and a few natural candidates leap out from what we know as scientists so many people would instinctively think the origin of life is a critical difficult step i've already hinted that it isn't that isn't so so sure if life evolved pretty early or pretty quickly on earth but there are some steps since then that are definitely difficult and one of those would be um, the origin of the familiar kind of photosynthesis that we're used to in the world today that makes oxygen as a waste product and then created an oxygen rich atmosphere um, that took about a billion years to evolve at least if not longer and then it looks like the origin of complex animal life is potentially a really difficult evolutionary step and it's probably about 700 600 million years ago and then it's speculative but it could be a it could be quite difficult to evolve our kind of um, advanced language and a social so high corresponding social uh, advanced social behavior and and ability to transform the world we're certainly the first animal to to be transforming the world in extraordinary new ways so yeah origin of life maybe origin of oxygen and complex cells as well um, which I didn't talk about those are possible critical steps then maybe the origin of animals and it, it sort of fits the model it looks about right that we really can see that there are these three or four critical steps in our history mm -hmm. could it be that if life uh, didn't follow these steps at a certain point uh, all life on earth could have gone extinct or, or not? So the way to think about this model is, is it's a bit mind bending, but it's almost like you have to imagine um, um, a universe full of um, potentially of biospheres that some last develop further than others. Um, our very existence uh, with this advanced brain capacity, this ability to to be aware of the history of our biosphere, that's something special. That might be a lot rarer than life in general. And there may be many other biospheres that didn't get as far. And it's a part of this, this is a sort of cosmological model in a sense. It's a part of the model to think in, in those terms and think about um, what our our situation is not is is not the norm in some sense but it requires a number of uh, necessary particular conditions to to get to this point and that's what's really interesting to us to think about how there are these critical steps in earth history that build on the previous one so to get to where we are well yes you need life to start for sure but then you need the rise in oxygen to then allow the evolution of more complex cells that we call eukaryote cells as scientists, and then to make complex animals that are made out of lots of different types of eukaryote cell. You obviously needed the eukaryote cells before that. You actually need the oxygen to go up again to get to our kind of level of brain function. Um, and, and in that sense, yeah, it's, we're looking at a picture of a, a, we're in a special situation. It needs several things to go right. And there are lots of other worlds where you got, maybe it got through one step and then got stuck there or got to two and then failed. Um, yeah, so I suppose it's like imagining a, a universe that we have barely begun to observe, but is probably scattered with biospheres at different stages of development. Mm -hmm. Is multicellular life another one of those critical steps? I mean, at a certain point you mentioned complex life, but is that the same as multicellular? Not exactly, Ricardo. The distinction I would draw is that multicellularity in the broad sense has evolved independently about 11 times, roughly. 
And that tells you it can't be that difficult to do, just the sense of making an organism with different cells. I mean, plants have a different origin to animals, they have a different origin to multicellular fungi like mushrooms. But I place a particular emphasis on animals because we have a very special, I would say, you could argue it's a more advanced form of multicellularity in that we have um programmed death of our cells except for our stem cells uh, biologists would refer to it as apoptosis and that is like a policing mechanism to stop the cells going off and doing their own independent thing and the whole multicellular animal sort of falling apart <laughs> and of course cancer is what happens when that goes wrong and your cells do just start replicating and trying to do their own thing so that kind of multicellularity looks to be harder to evolve, the sort of animal-grade um, multicellularity. Plants are not in quite the same category because, for example, you can um, you know, cut a limb off a plant or propagate a plant onto another plant and they can regrow. They have some other qualities. So, yeah, I, if I was to be specific, I think, there's something a little bit more special in what people call animal-grade multicellularity than, than multicellularity in general. But still, it's, yeah, it's up for debate how difficult that is. Whereas the origin of our so-called eukaryote cells that's earlier, that only happened once. And that does seem to be a, a really special, difficult thing to do. It seems to have involved the fusion of previously free-living, what we call prokaryote life forms. Uh, and the same is true for this oxygen-producing photosynthesis. That seems to have been made by a fusion of previous types of photosynthesis. And almost innately, it's rare to get these fusion events to work to make a new kind of chimera, a new kind of composite life form, which is cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. So, I mean, before we get into humans, because one of the traits that really distinguishes us from uh, some other animals is the fact that we are ultra social. So is it the yeah. case that sociality or social animals constitute another revolution or not? Well, they, they certainly... Um, fit the definition of what biologists would call a major transition in evolution, uh, especially when you... So this would include social insects um, where you can have... We Biologists would say you have reproductive division of labour. You have like a, I don't know, a queen honeybee in the honeybee colony and everybody else is a sterile worker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. Clearly, it's not quite like that in the human realm, but this level of advanced sociality in various forms is like other major transitions in evolution. The point is it's difficult to evolve a new level of biological organization. And in this case, it's like the whole beehive is like sometimes referred to as a superorganism or the whole ant colony, or indeed the sometimes one might loosely refer to human societies like that. The point is, whenever you're getting a new level of biological organization, you always have the tension between creating this new level of organization that's usually going to replicate slower than the units it's made up of. And natural selection is always wanting to, is often optimizing for rapid uh, replication. So the, the components are sort of... Uh, intention with the new whole and the difficult problem is to explain how the the new whole or um organization is become stable it's usually framed as if it's um a kind of cooperative or altruistic um entity on the part of its constituents who have perhaps had to give up some of their ability to replicate faster to be part of the whole so they must get some payback for for giving up autonomy and being part of the whole. And then that's where the whole puzzle that I mentioned before of the origin of animals is particularly interesting because they have such advanced multicellularity, you and I, that all but our stem cells have completely given up that uh, the freedom to go off and do their own thing, if you like. 
so yeah social social insects so animal sociality in its various forms definitely looks like a a special transition in evolution it's not it's not a critical step to my mind simply because again it's happened independently i don't know how many times but but independently in you know in bees in ants in primates um so it's it's not so rare as to count as a critical step but it's clearly fairly special rare event and then the big question is whether the human kind of sociality has some really even more special qualities to it <laughs> yeah what about the evolution of culture is it also important here in terms of looking at different revolutions or not i think i think it's really important to think about the evolution of culture particularly obviously in the human realm i'm i'm actually working on this at the moment and about to publish a paper on how there's a revolution in evolutionary thinking happening at the moment where a lot of a several, several of us have started working on and thinking about how um new higher level systems uh, might not be selected on the basis of their ability to replicate or reproduce in the sense that an organism is but instead be selected based on their ability to persist and maintain a a stable configuration and also spread to dominate space um, over other systems. I call that survival of the systems, a bit like survival of the species. But where my thinking is going is uh, culture, cultural evolution is anyway a fantastic puzzle that people are trying to solve. Now, the dominant line of thinking has tended to be to try to make cultural evolution fit into the traditional Darwinian model of evolution and try to conceptualize culture as replicating and instead of genes you have little packets of cultural information and whatever well you know that that some of that argument sort of works up to a point but then it runs into difficulties if you want to try to rationalize why um some very general uh, modes of human behavior involving many disparate unrelated individuals and different ethno-linguistic groups and so on can form sometimes very what are recognized as coherent cultures and you might also say that something like agriculture this coupling of humans plants animals domestication recycling of nutrients water and so on that's like a system that's very persistent and it has a culture associated with it but maybe there's a different way of thinking about how that why that's so dominant and how it's it's outcompeted other types of human life like hunting and gathering or foraging and that's that might be where yeah where the survival of the system start idea starts to help us um alongside the more conventional ways of thinking about uh cultural evolution mm -hmm. So I've asked you about social animals. Uh, focusing on humans specifically, what would you say are some aspects of our sociality that distinguish us from other animals and uh, specifically from other great apes? Great question. Well, some biologists and ecologists talk about humans as having ultra sociality so what do they mean by that well they mean things like um we can go to pretty extreme levels of self-sacrifice on behalf of the species if you like or at least on behalf of a culture and here i'm thinking of um soldiers who are willing to give up their lives in war to defend their peak their culture or whatever you however you want to describe it their nation sometimes we don't that's pretty special i don't i don't think there's a really brilliant analog for for that in other primates certainly not in other primate social systems the other thing that i so that would be a you know that would be an example of where the things get pushed to quite an extreme uh in humans the other thing i want to mention about human sociality is is uh what i think is quite special that we have is is the the how advanced our language capability is so it's not it's not like some other primates and certainly some other birds and animals dolphins can te can learn some very rudimentary 
language, but no other animal seems to have the advanced language capability we have with grammar and syntax and the ability to convey really complex information um, through this beautiful language capability. Uh, that might be the thing that marked out our ancestors um, from previous Homo species, or possibly even from other what are called anatomically modern humans, Homo sapiens, that have been around for a couple of hundred, that they've, they've existed since about 200,000 years ago, and yet, and they were already spread to a degree around the world alongside other Homo erectus, Homo florensis, other 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 species in the genus Homo, but some there was some subgroup of our, uh, that turned out to be the ancestors of all of us alive today that appear to have come out of Africa maybe seventy thousand years ago, give or take. They had something very special about them because they're the they went on to either directly kill off or certainly outcompete um, all other Homo. Uh, that were in the world, and I, my suspicion is they didn't just have like clever weapons or something. That that our founder group, as you might call them, had the had this amazing language capability, and that might be, you know, why why we're the we're their descendants and the only ones left, because <laughs> we had that together with these qualities of of amongst that group clearly. Um, Ultra sociality, yeah, ability to for for to sacrifice oneself on behalf of the the community and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, is agriculture or the development of agriculture important here? I mean, uh, did it bring uh, new changes to the world as we know it? Agriculture certainly brought changes to the world, but it's worth noting that humans had already had a profound impact at least on other large animal species so before agriculture which dates to 11,000 years ago or so to the very beginning of what's called the interglacial period or the end of the ice age before that as humans or at least as our ancestors spread around the world um, and each continent they arrived in they tended to cause the extinction of other large animals um, with the slight exception for Africa where presumably the large animals were already habituated to humans who've been evolving there for millions of years in various species and forms anyway so the point is pre-agriculture we were changing the world and pre-agricultural humans were using fire in hunting and they, in so doing they were transforming landscapes um, Australia would be a great example of that but then agriculture took things to another level uh, in terms of the transformation of the world around us. It wasn't obviously the superior lifestyle, at least not for the first farmers. So there's a really interesting evolutionary puzzle in why, why has farming independently originated in six or seven locations around the world in just the last 11 or so thousand years? Clearly, it's got something going for it, but all the evidence is pointing to at the beginning of farming, if um, natural resources like wild populations of food, be it animal or plants, are good, it's not obvious why you'd opt to farm because early farming is very labor intensive and, and you were tended to have a worse life and more stunted growth and so on. Of course, so you can make an argument, maybe climate conditions deteriorated and that's selected for farming. You can also make an argument that those that did get into farming and early states as they began to form, well, they were partly policed to stay as part of the state, um, so they weren't allowed to leave in a sense, but also there was a demographic effect, meaning that um, to support farming, you needed to have a big family to work the fields, and then that has consequences through the generations. It means that farming populations start to readily outnumber non-farming populations. So whatever solves that puzzle of how agriculture gets started and, take, and gets started six or seven times, what becomes clear is because it fundamentally changes our relationship, again, with energy and materials, 
and it boosts our population ultimately, then it increases human impact on the rest of the world. And there's evidence that's debated but suggests that the beginnings of agriculture changed the composition of the atmosphere. Of course, there was deforestation to make those early agricultural fields and early agriculture wasn't that efficient, so you needed a lot of area. Um, and that released carbon to the atmosphere. Uh, there's an argument also that, that it, in the case of where rice paddies were being made 6,000 years ago in parts of the world, this created a new source of methane to the atmosphere. So this is Bill Ruderman's early Anthropocene hypothesis that, yep, that agricultural transition upped our impact on the world. And of course, later on, the Industrial Revolution upped it again. <laughs> Yeah, you mentioned the early Anthropocene, so uh, in terms of when the Anthropocene started, do mm -hmm. we need to go all the way back to agriculture or even before that? Um, it's a question I asked my class uh, when I had um, Mark Maslin, a friend and colleague, talking to them a couple of weeks ago. I got, them, I got my class to answer when they thought the Anthropocene should start. And I think you can make a case for everything from what you've, from what, the way you put it, you can make a case from everything from the first megafauna extinctions, which start about 50 odd thousand years ago, right through to the 1950s um, nuclear weapon tests. Uh, and people are arguing for each a series of options in uh, either end or in between. Um, my personal view is it matters politically which, which time we choose to start the Anthropocene and stratigraphers are arguing about how to, which, which to choose. But to me, it's not nearly as interesting as, as understanding the phenomenon and the consequences of, of our ongoing evolution. So I have to say I'm less worried about the choice that's made us to the start um, from a science point of view, although I recognize its political importance. I, I'm just interested to, to, for everybody to understand a bit more about how we have been transforming the world in ever greater degrees over tens of thousands of years. <laughs> yeah, so what are some of the most visible ways we are having an impact on the world now? Well, with the Anthropocene. It might seem odd to answer with an invisible gas, but the carbon dioxide is, by in mass terms, our largest pollutant, um, at totaling about a bit over 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide every year coming from our collective civilizations. That that's the largest waste product we make, even though we can't see it, um, and. Of course it's changing the climate acidifying the oceans and so on um following that then cement and concrete i think would be the next biggest in mass terms i've forgotten the exact number but it's also in the billions of tons per year that are being made um and then we carry on to other obvious things a lot of publicity in recent years about our plastic waste and a friend of mine jan zelasevic who's of course, part of the Anthropocene Commission has calculated, I think, that if if you stretched out all our plastic waste over the whole planet, you could you would definitely cover it with at least one fil film of cling film over the whole planet. And I think it comes out at more like two or three wrappings of the whole planet in think, uh, cling film, we call it in the Britain. <laughs> so those things are pretty visible impacts of humans. Um, I would say that uh, now we've become accustomed to images of the Earth taken by satellites from space, then one of the most obvious impacts of humans is to have completely transformed a fair chunk of the land surface for agriculture. So about 40-ish about percent of the productive land surface has um, gone over to agriculture when previously a lot of it would have been forest. So yeah, that's just a taster. And um, I think Jan, who I mentioned, has this beautiful uh, thought experiment where you imagine a square meter of the Earth's surface and you think and you calculate 
for, for a square for the average square meter of the Earth's surface, what how much concrete is there from human activities? How much CO2 is there in the atmosphere above? How much the, there's those three films of plastic over the top of it, and so on. One could one could go on almost endlessly listing the various things you'd find in that square meter. You'd find these traces of a bizarre chemicals we've produced, and so on. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that climate change will lead evolution in other directions? I mean, will it create new selective pressures over uh, the species? It, it is already, I think, creating new selective pressures for our species as well as for other species. Um, it's more natural for us to think about what's going on with other species because, of course, Historically, we've been destroying them principally by removing their habitats. That's land use change or destruction of the sea floor through brutal trawling or breaking up of coral reefs or whatever. But we're, gonna, we're risking getting to the point where we make climate change a bigger, as big a killer of other species as, as these habitat losses or changes. Um, but of course, that species are not static they're as you say they're evolving all the time so the question is can adaptation um keep up with the rate of change in from the climate or from other human causes generally the fear is oh dear it probably can't keep up in lots of instances but in some we already see evolution happening pretty quickly in response to our activities just as we saw it in the Industrial Revolution with the famous example in the UK, which was these peppered moths that used to be white, but then when industrial soot started coating trees, buildings, etc., in industrial England, the moths evolved pretty quickly to be black. <laughs> so yeah, something akin to that uh, is happening in some lineages under climate change, but at the same time, the general story is it's hard for evolution of big, of big creatures, at least, to keep up But then we look, then it's great to, or interesting to think about us and um, are we in a sense evolving in response to this global change, this climate change of our own making? I would say that we are, but it, yeah, it's there's a lot of ways that that could unfold. Um, and one can make a case that being challenged to by a new problem is what is kind of what drove the evolution of complex societies in the first place so i i lean towards the view that social complexity arose not just not because the world was magically stable and wonderful and like the garden of eden but rather it's pretty obvious that advanced societies first evolved in not the most obvious climatic parts of the world, like dry places like Mesopotamia, um, and overwhelmingly in drier places, in fact, in, in sort of challenging environments where maybe you needed social complexity to manage water resources and so on and so forth. So there's a little bit of optimistic me that thinks that the climate change of our own making is potentially Got, got to trigger us to evolve, to solve this, got to, to adapt to and solve this problem of our own making now and, and actually achieve a bit more social complexity or advancement um, to deal with it. That's, that's the optimistic view. It's not, not the only view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, looking into the future, can we expect to have new revolutions somewhere in the future and is it possible to predict them? Well, the thing I'm excited about is is to voice the possibility that we create could create another revolutionary change of the earth if we collectively um, chose to. Uh, and by that, I mean, if we're going to have a long and happy future as a species on this planet, then we've got to change our major source of energy from fossil fuels, which are finite and have all these nasty consequences from the waste products to essentially a renewable energy future, which will be dominated by solar power and wind power as well, I think. But then we also need to solve this, the cycling of materials problem, because currently we just make whatever we want generally by 
digging stuff out of the ground, refining it and making new things out of it. And then we chuck those away back into landfill or into the atmosphere or into the ocean. We've got to get away from that. We've got to learn from the biosphere, close the cycling of materials in the sense that we make new things out of the old stuff we already have. That is like a revolution, at least in thinking and in our technology. Um, but it could be a really good one for human flourishing and a long-term human flourishing at that. So I like to say, well, that is the sort of revolutionary path towards a better future for us, as contrasted with if we just carry on doing what we're doing, I'm convinced that we're just going to bring about our own demise. And, it, and equally, I don't think it's tenable for, to advocate for what I call retreat, which is to, to believe that people are going to magically, uh, who already overconsume, are going to do a fantastic job of deciding to reduce their consumption. Um, instead, I think we have a, a lot of energy available from the sun, so we don't need to think about being limited by energy in the future. We just have to change our sources. But we, and we as I said, we have to change our relationship with materials. And then we can have, yeah, then we can still have loads of electricity, we can have lots of things, but we make those things out of existing things using some of that renewable energy to do it. And then we're on a very different path to what what others are arguing for with retreat is kind of degrowth and things that, whilst I have some, some sympathy with the arguments, I think are also, uh, when you look at it for not, for a projected 9 billion people in, in about 30 years' time, are just not, they're not tenable and they could have some very bad consequences. So we need this, we need this other path. We need to believe that there's a, that there's a, what I call a, yeah, a revolutionary change going forwards rather than backwards. Mm -hmm. So knowing what we know about the sort of geophysical and geochemical ingredients that we need to have set in place for life to evolve, should we expect life to be common in the universe? I think that simple life we should expect to be fairly common, by which I guess in, in Earth terms we'd call prokaryote life, which we would now call, we'd label bacteria and archaea, the two big kingdoms of the simplest cells. Judging by how quickly um, that evolved on Earth, I would think that alone tells us it can't be that hard to evolve and there'll be something a bit like what we recognize as those prokaryote life forms on Earth, simplest cells, um, will have arisen elsewhere in the universe. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that complex life at our level of self-awareness, etc., is common. On, on the contrary, I lean towards the view that that could be well, well, simple life could be relatively common. Um, complex life can still be pretty rare and special because of the critical steps that are lie in between. Yeah, but I believe that the that you can, given how early life on Earth could get hold of cycling the elements it needed and affect the climate and so on, I think what we might call Gaia's other self-regulating simple biospheres could be dotted around um, our galaxy and other galaxies and there's a chance with new space telescope technology and so on that even in the rest of my lifetime we might see whether we can see the signal of, of life uh, affecting the atmosphere of, of planets around other stars in, in nearby bits of our galaxy and that will be possibly the greatest scientific discovery of this century, if, it, if it's indeed made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see. Okay, so one, yeah, one last question. Uh, once we have the necessary conditions set in place, could we say that life on Earth was inevitable? I wouldn't say that, partly because... As a scientist, you're you're in, you're conditioned to think about all the conditionalities and the roles of 
what was once called chance and necessity and the tension between that in in both the origin and the evolution of life so talking about inevitabilities is sort of not in the lexicon not in the language of my thinking because i i always think in probabilistic terms and that is the scientific way um it's a really great and sort of philosophical question to to end on in a way but essentially whilst i acknowledge that life seemed to evolve relatively quickly or relatively early on earth we could still be talking tens of millions of years to evolve and for sure there are some steps in the evolution of life as we recognize it that that do look hard and the one i haven't really emphasized is how you have um this fantastic uh information store the, the genetic code let's call it that if there's one really hard step in the origin of life or uh, it's that one uh, for the if 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 to call something life is to say it as a genetic code which we could debate as well but let's say it is then that was the hard thing to to come up with this clever information store that was where information was in sort of packets and letters literally and could be replicated that that doesn't look easy to evolve there's not it's certainly not inevitable that you can evolve that from all the research that's been done on it but clearly it did evolve on Earth, and it would be an essential ingredient of life anywhere, I think, that you have that um, information storage capacity that can then encode the uh, structure and the metabolism of, of the cell. Um, so, yeah, some special things um, had to happen, and that took maybe quite a lot of replications or quite a lot of tries before it got to that point. Um, yeah, and that's where I guess I, I would leave it, that it's not, it's not inevitable, but it can't, but it seems to be, uh, certainly it's obviously not impossible, and it might not be as hard as we might once have assumed to start life. And ironically, in the case of the Earth, some of the steps that happened later might have been harder than the original origin in terms of the number of pieces, if you like, that had to come together for something to work. And that's a kind of unusual thought. I think it challenges our, our the way we've been brought up to think about our story, if you like. My, my feeling is I was brought up to think that the origin of life was the really, really un, unexpected, difficult, special thing. And everything else that happened since just took a bit of time, you know. <laughs> On the contrary, I, I think, yeah, the origin of life is difficult, but it's not as hard as going from simple cells to complex cells, for example, or possibly not as hard as um, feet using together the chemical capability to split water and molecules in photosynthesis and generate oxygen as a waste product. Uh, and in that sense, uh, that's why I can see this possibility of a universe and a galaxy populated with some simple life and not with lots of complex life <laughs> yeah okay so let's end on that note just before we go dr lenton would you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find your work oh that's a good good question ricardo um well you can find out what we're doing on contemporary sustainability and climate change and so on um at, i guess the global systems institute website which you can find probably if you google exeter gsi or global systems institute um try to publish my work um open source where i can these days as well um and you mentioned it's very old-fashioned it's not the internet but you mentioned the books i've written and uh yeah, I tried to encapsulate some of this thinking there. Uh, so, yeah, um, enjoy it is what I'd say to anyone who's inspired by any of what we've discussed because there's there's a revolution of thinking going on it quietly in science. It's changing how we see our place in the world. 
And those revolutions don't happen very often. And when they do happen, like in the previous case of Copernicus and Galileo and reorientating ourselves to see that the sun was at the center of the world, the universe, not the earth, that had massive political consequences. So the suspicion that I share with other friends is that the, the quiet revolution in how our place in the world that's going on now, that will ultimately have much wider social political um, ramifications, hopefully in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's hope. Okay, so Dr. Linton, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Ricardo. It was great. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with top academics and scholars from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you prefer PayPal, I also have links to that in the description box of the video. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please leave a like, share it and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett Perga Larsen. Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Kintis, Ruth Gervoz, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Yevan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassi Ladeza Araujo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, and Yannick Punter. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardis France, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rujewski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.